for joining us today. My name is Diana Lopez and I'm the uh, Vice President of the Texas Institute of Letters. Um, I'm coming to you from my hometown of Corpus Christi. Uh, and so I'm, I decided to use a screensaver just to show off our beautiful uh, beachside city. Uh, and I'm very excited to uh, be hosting this new member reading. Uh, it is a tradition of ours at the Texas Institute of Letters to celebrate our new members with a, a reading every year at the banquet. But of course, since the banquet is virtual, we're doing our readings virtually. <laughs> so thank you, all of you. Uh, and you know, March is also Women's History Month. And I think uh, that it's very fitting uh, to kick off our new member readings by celebrating our, our new women into uh, TIL. So thank you, all of you. Um, we're going to begin with uh, Crystal Allen. Uh, Crystal Allen is the author of five middle grade books, all published by Balzar and Bray HarperCollins. Her accolades include the 2018 uh, Society of Children's Book Writers and Illustrators Sid Fleshman Humor, Humor Award for the magnificent Maya Tibbs, The Wall of Fame Game. She's also received starred reviews from Publishers Weekly, Kirkus, and School Library Journal. Inclusion on state book award list, including the, blue, the Texas Blue Bonnet. She serves as a committee member of the Brown Bookshelf and as co-director co -director of Kindling Words East, and she teaches for Highlights for Children. Her forthcoming book, Between Two Brothers, will release in the fall of 2022. Crystal lives in Sugarland, Texas with her husband, Reggie, and two sons, Philip and Joshua. Welcome, Crystal Allen. So you all can hear me. Thank you so much. Uh, and I'm so honored um, to be with you all this morning and so honored to have received this accolade. I'd like to read to you um, from my favorite book that I've written. Uh, it's called The Loreline. And since it is uh, International w Women's Month. I thought this was appropriate. It's a historical fiction, uh, but I really, really love this book. Um, okay, here we go. Chapter one, sweet mother of Teen Vogue magazine. I'm model marvelous in this new outfit. And when the doors of the bus open like stage curtains, I pooch my lips raise my chin and use the school sidewalk as my runway. A rhythm I didn't know I had moves my feet to a beat only I can hear. But it's all good because I know I look amazing. This shiny black and gray sweater with the matching black pants is getting lots of looks from my classmates. That's because this outfit screams Laura Dyson's in the house, and I'm going to let it talk for me all day. My girl Sage will be here soon, so I lean against a pole and cop a pose while I wait for her bus. The spring breeze blows my pigtails, and I can't help but think the wind is tr just trying to cool me down because I look so hot. I close my eyes and daydream as my thoughts quickly drift to an exotic island in the Caribbean, where a photographer gives me detailed instructions on how to pose for the cover of Girl's Life. I got my outfit and my attitude work in the cameras as the entire crew gives me thumbs up and, and a huge smile. But suddenly the smiles turn upside down and, and so did the thumbs as my daydream fades. Hey, fat larda. <laughs> The exotic, the exotic island disappears when the laughter grows louder. My eyelids snap open and there in front of me is a giggly crowd of my classmates led by Sunny Rasmussen. Sunny scans my outfit, rolls her eyes and says the worst thing ever. Are you daydreaming again or just holding up that pole behind you, fat Larda? I step away from the pole and squint. The name's Laura. She smirks and passes me. That was almost as funny as the costume you're wearing. 
I study my outfit. Am I wearing a costume? Was I wrong? Ah, uh, heck to the double no. This outfit bangs. I figured out Sonny's problem. She's mad because today I'm the best dressed seventh grader in Brooks County, Texas, and maybe even on the whole planet. If I were a student in a modeling academy instead of here, I wouldn't have to deal with haters like Sonny Rasmussen. I'd learn about fashion and makeup and cool stuff like that instead of this useless junk I'm taught here at Royal Middle School. Why do I need an English class? Models don't talk, they walk. And I don't need math. It's not about how many steps I take. It's about how smooth I stroll down the runway. And the only history I'll need is what I wore yesterday. So I don't wear the same thing two days in a row. Laura, it's Sage, but I can tell by the way she keeps looking left and right before stepping off the bus that something's wrong. I'm thinking her drama has to do with why she's wearing a coat buttoned all the way up to her neck. I frown, then point and wiggle my finger at her. Sage, what? She blows by me, come on, I need help. I don't wanna run, but when I do, because when I do, my thighs rub together and my pants will make that wishy, wishy, wishy noise. This outfit is supposed to be beautiful, not musical. I try to keep up with her and dig for clues at the same time. Can you slow down and let me, and just tell me what's wrong? She yanks the school door and it flies wide open as she heads down the hall towards the girls' restroom near the back of the building. Nobody uses that restroom because the dumpster is near it and sometimes it reeks in there. But this spot is perfect for us because we don't have to worry about other girls watching us or asking us what size we wear. Just hurry, Laura. Okay, okay, I'm right behind you. In the restroom, Sage slides her backpack down her arms until it plops on the tile near her feet. She unbuttons her coat, peels it off, and lets it drop on the floor too. She's wearing the new outfit she bought last night. I can't help but grin as she slowly spins in front of me. But honest, Lord, does, does this make me look, you know, Sage is always looking for something to make her look thinner. She never uses words like fat or big to describe her shape. Anything she's uncomfortable saying, she just won't. As if the words were forbidden, I shake my head. You look great, Sage. She pulls at the collar of her black and white blouse, then fluffs her hair. Seriously? Does this white in this blouse clash with my blonde hair? It's too much black and white, isn't it? What about up front? Does it hide my, you know, I examine her from head to toe, even walk around her. She moves one of her pigtails off the front. Of, she moves one of my pigtails off the front of my shoulder to the back and grins at me. By the way, you look fabulous. And I like your necklace. I touch my necklace and freeze. That's it. I back up toward the mirror, rest my backpack on the sink, unzip it, and dig deep in the corner near my candy stash. There it is. I keep a vinyl pouch with extra jewelry just in case I don't have time to put it on before I leave home. I reach inside the pouch and grab two red bracelets, red earrings, and the matching red necklace. I hand Sage the bracelet and earring. Here, put these on while I fasten your necklace. Sage shoves her hand through the bracelet until the loop and until they loop her wrist and then puts the earrings on. She looks my way. I grin with my hands on my hips. We look gorgeous. I turn toward the mirror. See for yourself. Sage stares at her reflection. Her eyebrows lower as she vogues with me. Then we, then she reaches over and gives me a hug. You are such a fashion goddess, Laura. The red sets off the outfit in the best way ever. I zip my jewelry pouch as Sage takes a brush from her coat pocket. She brushes her long hair and talks at the same time. Did you get your essay done last night? I nod, yep. It was a hard choice between being a model and she stops brushing, don't say it, Laura, and a baseball pitcher. She's glaring at me. So you wrote your essay on? I stare at the sink. Why well, I want to be a model when I get out of college. Sage sighs, good. Baseball's not a girl thing, Laura. 
How many women pitchers are there in major leagues? Let's see. How about none? I hold up a finger. That's not true. There's women pitchers in the minor leagues and one even through batting practice in Arizona during spring training. Sage size. Okay. How many girls here in Brooks County play baseball? How about zip? Zero. Nunzo, Rapunzo. Stick with modeling. It's safer. You won't get laughed at. I think about Sunny. Yeah, maybe you're right. I keep digging through my backpack, but quickly stop. Oh no, Sage steps closer. What are you looking for? I think I left my calculator at home. The restroom is so quiet that we can hear voices through the air conditioning vents. Sage puts her brush down. Mr. Belcher hasn't done a supplies check in this period this week. I shake my head third period either. I'm in deep trouble and Sage says what I already know. Then today's the day. You're gonna get a zero if you don't have that calculator. The first bell rings and that means classes start in five minutes. I dig like crazy in my bag. I've gotta find it. I can't get a zero for the day, not over a dumb calculator. Sage opens her backpack and hands me hers. Here, problem solved. I, tap, I take the calculator and breathe a sigh of relief. Thanks, Sage. She grins and puts her hand on my shoulder. I will always, I nod and put my hand on hers. Have your back. We flick imaginary dust off each other's shoulders, gather our things and rush to class. I make it to English just before the bell rings. Once I place my essay with the others on Mr. Helms's desk, I take my seat in the back of the first row. I like it there because I can rest my shoulders on the cement wall when it gets too hot in class and that cools my shoulders down. Mr. Helms steps in, closes the door and takes attendance. Then he grabs the stack of papers. Well, this stack feels pretty good. I'm guessing each of you got your essay finished. Let's have some fun. I'll read a few titles and you try to guess who the writer is, okay? Mr. Helms mixes the reports up as if he's shuffling cards, then pulls one from the stack. This one is entitled, Why I Want to Be a Professional Baseball Player. Any guesses? Hands go up everywhere. Mr. Helms calls on Jake Collins. That's got to be Shane Doyle's essay. Mr. Helms smiles. You're right. Here's another. Why I Want to Be a Pediatrician. Everybody knows that's Bindu Shaw. Both of her parents are pediatricians. Somebody shouts out the answer and Mr. Helms puts, up, he puts his hand up. Let's keep it fair. Please raise your hand instead of shouting out the answer. Okay, this next one is entitled, Why I Want to Be a Professional Model. Any guesses? I look around the room, wondering if anyone else has the same dream I've got. Mr. Helms calls on five different students and they all give wrong answers. He stands at my desk. The correct answer is Laura Dyson. First, there's silence. And I'm thinking, I've blown everybody away. But then whispers turn to giggles that explode into full blown laughter. Heat rushes through my chest and up my neck, filling my head because they're not just laughing at me right now. They're laughing at me in the future too. Shane Doyle's laughs louder than anyone as he adds my nickname to his chuckle, <laughs> Fat Larda. Mr. Helms snaps a response, Shane. One more remark like that and you're out of here. Now everybody's staring at me as if I'm the one who got Shane in trouble. I grab the ends of my pigtails and stare at my desk. I hate this class. Once the room's quiet, Mr. Helms reads the title of the next essay. Hands go up in the air as my classmates correctly guess the writer. I tune out the guessing game and realize Sage was wrong. I could have written about baseball because it didn't matter. They were gonna laugh at me no matter what I wrote. Thank you so much. I, I just love the humor and I love the vulnerability in, of your characters. Uh, very, very pleasant to hear. Thank you, Crystal. Thank you, Diana. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Thanks for being here. Uh, and next we're going to hear from Gail Caldwell. Uh, she is the former book chief critic for the Boston Globe, where she was a staff writer for more than 20 years. Uh, in 2001, she was awarded the Pulitzer Prize for Distinguished Criticism. 
She is the author of four memoirs, A Strong West Wind about her native Texas, Let's Take the Long Way Home, which won the New England Independent Booksellers Award for nonfiction, New Life, New Instructions, and Bright Precious Thing. She lives in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Welcome, Gail. Thanks, you guys. Wonderful to be here. I logged on a minute ago in this new Zoom world and, and heard the lilt of Texas voices, our Southern voices, which was a great relief. Um, I'm up here in cold Cambridge and I want to read from two uh, books today. First is a selection of my first book, which is about Texas called A Strong West Wind. And uh, it feels fitting because of the occasion. And also like uh, so many writers, I think I have a, a special affinity for all the, the errors that I made in this book and, and the passion that went into it. So I wanna read just the beginning of that book and then um, another reading from uh, Long Way Home. For a long time, my want for Texas was so veiled in guilt and ambiguity that I couldn't claim it for the sadness it was. I missed the people and the land and the sky. My God, I missed the sky. But most of all, I missed the sense of placid mystery the place evoked, endemic there as heat is to thunder. You can be gone for years from Texas, I now believe, and still be felled by such memories. Some moment on a silent afternoon, a cast of light, some gesture by a stranger, can fill you with a longing that, by the laws of desire, will always remain unmet. The truth was that I had been glad to go, that when I drove across the Tennessee River Bridge, I had wept with a kind of wild relief. The morning I left Austin was on a hot Friday in June, and my old Volvo overheated 80 miles north of town. My response was to pull the thermostat, throw four gallons of water in the back seat, and keep going. I drove through remote little East Texas towns named Dangerfield and New Boston, certain that such places divined what I was leaving and what I was going toward. The trunk of the car held an oriental rug a beat up German typewriter and a quart of Jack Daniels. And I racked up 500 miles a day pointed north by northeast, listening to Springsteen and Little Feet. At night, exhausted, I checked into cheap hotels along the highway where I collapsed with a glass of bourbon and Sophie's Choice, imagining that my new existence would be a female variation on Styron Stingo. He was a Southern boy after all. He knew a good tragedy when he saw it and he had migrated all the way to Brooklyn to become a writer. Irritated by my mother's ordinary concerns, I called her finally from New Jersey to announce that I was safe and that I had crossed four state lines in one day. Because she had spent most of her life landlocked in Amarillo, where you can see halfway to New Mexico without leaving Texas. She didn't believe me. Surely even the minuscule states of the East took longer than that to get across. I made it to New York, then Cambridge, days after the summer solstice, that time of innocence and rue when the sun is poised for diminishing returns, but seems as though it will hold you in its light forever. It was 1981 and I was 30 years old. And while I scarcely knew it at the time, I had just finished, or rather launched, an odyssey I'd been plotting my entire life. My, the next thing I want to read is um, a book that I actually love the most of everything I've written. And when I say love, I don't, I mean that in the sense of my emotional attachment to it. Um, though I suppose every writer feels that way. It's like your children, you know, you, you love everybody for different reasons. Um, this is, let's take the long way home um, about a, 
wonderful friendship in my life. And the book was so emotionally um, challenging and powerful for me to write that I actually wrote the beginning of it, the first sentence, and then left it on a legal pad for like two years before I went back to it. Um, so this is, I'll leave that introduction to be um, enough. I can still see her standing on the shore, a towel around her neck and a post-workout cigarette in her hand. Half Gidget and half Splendid Splinter, her rower's arms in defiant contrast to the awful pink bathing suit she'd found somewhere. It was the summer of 1997 and Caroline and I had decided to swap sports. I would give her swimming lessons and she would teach me how to row. This arrangement explained why I was crouched in my closest friend's needle thin racing shell, 12 inches across at its widest span, looking less like a rower than a drunken spider. We were on New Hampshire's Chikorowa Lake, a pristine mile long body of water near the White Mountains. And the only other person there to watch my exploits was our friend Tom, who was with us on vacation. Excellent, Caroline called out to me every time I made the slightest maneuver, however feeble. I was clinging to my oars with a white knuckled grip. At 37, Caroline had been rowing for more than a decade. I was nearly nine years older, a lifelong swimmer, and figured I still had the physical wherewithal to grasp the basics of a skull upon the water. But as much as I longed to imitate Caroline, whose stroke had the precision of a metronome, I hadn't realized that merely sitting in the boat would feel as unstable as balancing on a floating leaf. How had I let her talk me into this? Novice scholars usually learn in about twice the width and weight of Caroline's Van Dusen. Later, she confessed that she couldn't wait to see me flip. But poised there on water's edge, hollering instructions, she was all good cheer and steely enthusiasm. The oar is my only leverage. I started listing toward the water and then froze there at a precarious 60 degree angle held more by paralysis than any sense of balance. Tom was belly laughing from the dock. The farther I tipped, the harder he laughed. I'm going in, I cried. No, you're not, said Caroline. Her face is deadpan as a coach's in a losing season. No, you're not. Keep your hands together. Stay still. Don't look at the water. Look at your hands. Now look at me. The voice consoled and instructed long enough for me to straighten into position. And I managed five or six strokes across flat water before I went flying out of the boat and into the lake. By the time I came up a few seconds later and 10 yards out, Caroline was laughing and I had been given a glimpse of the rapture. The three of us had gone to Chikorua for the month of August after Tom had placed an ad for a summer rental. Three riders with dogs seek house near water and hiking trails. The result of his search was a ramshackle 19th century farmhouse that we would return to for years. The lake was a few hundred yards away. Mornings and some evenings, Caroline and I would leave behind the dogs watching from the front windows and walk down to the water where she rode the length of the lake and I swam its perimeter. I was the otter and she was the dragonfly and I'd stop every so often to watch her flight back and forth for six certain miles. Sometimes she pulled over into the marshes so she could scrutinize my flip turns in the water. We had been friends for a couple of years by then and we had the competitive spirit that belongs to sisters or adolescent girls. Each of us wanted whatever prowess the other possessed. I have a photograph from one of those summers at Shikorowa, framing the backs of my dog and Caroline's 
who are silhouetted in the window seat and looking outside. It is the classic dog photo, capturing vigilance and loyalty, two tails resting side by side, two animals glued to their post. What I didn't realize for years is that in the middle distance of the picture, through the window and out to the fields beyond, you can make out the smallest of figures, an outline of Caroline and me walking down the hill. We must have been on our way to the lake and the dogs, by now familiar with our routine, had assumed their positions. Caroline's boyfriend, a photographer, had seen the beauty of the shot and grabbed his camera. I discovered this image the year after she died and it has always seemed like a clue in a painting, a secret garden revealed only after it is gone. Chikurawa itself has taken on an idyllic glow. I remember the night Caroline nearly beat Tom at arm wrestling, the mouse that sent me onto the dining room table while she howled with laughter, the best camper awards we instituted and that she always won. I have glossed over the mosquitoes the day Caroline got angry when I left her in a slower moving kayak and rode off into the fog alone. Like most memories tinged with the final chapter, mine carry the physical weight of sadness. What they never tell you about grief is that missing someone is the simple part. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was beautiful. And I really enjoyed um, listening to your memories of leaving Texas and to your memories of Caroline. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, Next, we're going to hear from Allison Adele Hedge Koch. Um, her honors include uh, the 2021 AWP George Garrett Award, the 2020 Dan and Maggie Inoue Distinguished Chair in Democratic Ideals at the University of Hawaii, um, the 2019 Fulbright Scholar in Montenegro, First Jade Female Poetry Festival Suhui China Inaugural Prize, Excellent Foreign Poet, and the U.S. Library of Congress Witter Biner Award, Lifetime Achievement Award from the NWCA, uh, the American Book Award, and the King Chavez Parks Award, Penn Southwest Poetry Award, and the Ippy Medal. Born in Texas, she comes from working fields, factories, horses, and waters. She is a distinguished professor at the University of California, Riverside. Welcome, Allison. Thank you. I'm gonna start with a poem called Leaving. No matter how he rested himself silent at night, six days post-stroke, he woke fluent in former languages, backtracking this time here. Mercy nurses, attendants, remedied in their own. Once he registered, all he called out was, if it's too far gone, we need to talk. All of this, what I am, doesn't know how to die. All I know how to do is survive, it's all I ever done. If it's time, tell me, tell me, give me four days. I'd like to have that blanket Dustin designed. Damn it, I hate to leave this beauty, life. On the fourth came the Pendleton, delivered right on time. His breath slowed, eased, then quit. That was it. After some hours, the rest of us slept. Some of us sleep, still left. Okay, the second poem is Taxonomy. Mornings made del delirious, scrambling into thread out from dreaming, wrangling ways past delusions into streets unpaved, unproven, unmet. It was hard over, no sunny side, easy, and the only yoke was seated in sky. Rose streaming over the lot of us, quickened in some strain no corona could bear resting lean to. 
then the mesa set standing wayside, in case some giants made their way back into meantime, met us here, met us. We were tabooed, shunned, mocked, and on our metal, most any pierce of day. Principles struck blows to show we deserve no mercy. It was splintering, holes bored blisters, each smacking wave we were deserving. Wave after wave, first grade took the test out from me. Never did spill again, no matter the syndrome. We were anything but beggars. So we scraped by, held up, flung ourselves into every angle, withheld our curve, split loose from whatever held on. Motown made our mercy, only soothe in Western rooms, rounded in radio waves, gleaning out the insides of maternal mind. An unkind charge firing synapse beyond her reasoning goals. She moved through it like lightning, charging each wave with serious challenge, but nothing made it bearable, and hands down was just a game called brag. Only hands down we laid was on ball courts. Home front was daily challenge. There was nothing certain other than each day, just like the last. Lest they moved you, sent you off to foster somewhere, no one warned might reckon, sent you streaming. Gave you up like paper, tossed, crumpled, straightened up, and smoothed out flat, and that was that. It was nothing you'd remember, but we do. Still taste that strangeness surrounding ones who go between, move through other worlds while in this one. No one lived like we do, at least it seems so, always on the mind. Why? Never time to question and still don't know. Only thing we know is we are different and not like you. And even though we try three times harder, it never works out right. No, nothing takes the sting of it or our scent either. We look off, sound off, give off a presence everyone else knows stay away from, and they do. So far from us, we walk sideways, vanishing points, return to horizons soaking us in, distinguishing us, metal in our mouths as well, steely, and still we did, still do. No one's got more lift than us. No one's got more hunger. How about the time they made us breakfast? Real one. Over that pancake house off 40, remember? Dad's Christmas to us right before seeing her off to the pavilion. Little dish of butter looks like ice cream to kids like us. Made the eggs slide over easy, just like he did before the madness. And this is rough country. Get that straight. Metal this. And the next poem is Sudden Wear. It's a companion poem for that one. Talon plucked, speckled trout from bitterroot bed, splish dream through cloud swells, turbulence imagining comfort on the way to forever. It's a shake of it. The sudden wear, like tossing suitcases into corners lent for foster kids untangling claws still extended. Not the best of us, no, not near what we once were. Still only children. We scraped by, skinning knees on borrowed bikes, traded at B&D, cousin tame, since no one else had time to tender us. It was a working world, cast out toothbrush hanging wherever a hook held still enough. Nine lives by nine, cut, torn, blasted to bits all around us, while sometimes plastered with brain noodle, literally, in some fascination led Western so-and-so. Was there a baseball coach showed us conceal, marched us into Sears and Roebuck night before her wedding, wanted something scanty, little girls could come outside without losing dimes, much less dollars. No coins better spent at skating drive-in joint. Teens hanging over Mustang glass, blinking easy, leaving all intended puffs, smoke, Bottled down splash to sink secure, like fishing, like something some winged friend would come down this way for. She was good to us, even when we couldn't be to one another. Save the lifting. Her heft carried us through. Far more than Siebert pranks, stealing plums when Uncle carefully turned his head shy. Only a baby then. That was way back. No, here we were nine just old enough to flee the napper in his filthy white pickup. He came to carry us home, his maybe, never come back. 
Oh, we ran. Yeah, we ran right around corners, alleyways, fields, crossed the way to Kochu, threw down, challenging the perv. Tell he fled from what he knew. Next year, they had me up in the Oda riding killer horses, crow on shoulders, toughened up like Clint might be. I was the high plains drifter at 10. At least that town thought so. A woodlands girl here in bold and never right for roping, just running all through time, split sometimes just to joke it before laughter was real, back when hard was a given, a gist for gimmicking while winding back roads with the curved spine of kids who stayed hungry and what was food, mac and cheese, plums when we could steal some, peanut butter stirred with a spoon, oily, tasty. Now and then someone took us fishing, maybe bluegill, maybe crappy, maybe we'd find something magnificent, give it up to make somebody happy. Far from us anyways, we thought we were. We thought we were unbreakable. We tried so many times to snuff ourselves, each other. Blunders were our closest friends. They kept us from soaring over cloud dreams, swimming in deepest water, skimming surfaces and grasslands without a notion of when we'd make it back to the pines calling us home. And that was fostering, sudden wear, being left to airs, to talons lifting sometimes tearing our scales as they raised us. Thank you. Thank you so much. I love the musicality and the imagery and I love all of your beautiful voices and just how, uh, how wonderful group readings are because of, of the variety in, in, in our voices, in our stories and, and in our styles. Um, so thank you so much for spending this, this day with us. Uh, I want to um, let people know that on March 27th, we're going to have our next uh, new member reading. Uh, and this will feature uh, Kevin Prufer, David Levinson, Tony Diaz, and Scott Wiggerman. So set your calendars. It will uh, be at 11 uh, a.m. Central Time. And we really look forward to hearing from them and, and, uh, and celebrating their voices as well. Thanks to all of you. And I hope you have a wonderful day. Mm-hmm. <laughs>